Hello and welcome. I am Hiralal Mandal. I am going to discuss today the contract farming laws. So let's get started. So recently you have heard that the government of India has passed contract farming laws. There are three farming laws have been passed by the government in September 2020. Among them, one of the important law is related to contract farming laws. So we'll discuss about the pros and cons of contract farming laws. We'll also talk about what is contract farming. We'll look at the various facets of contract farming and at the same time, we'll discuss about the growth of contract farming in the country. So the first thing first, this issue is being discussed because of the fact that currently farmers are protesting and the farmers protest have entered into six months. And therefore, the opposition parties are continuously appealing to the government to resume talks with the farmers. There is one criticism that is made against the government that they have introduced the laws without adequate consultation with the stakeholders. In this context, let us today discuss how far this criticism is valid for Contract Farming Act. In this context, we will discuss the various facets of contract farming. So the first thing we, we are going to discuss about the contract farming. What is contract farming? So if you look at the word itself, it's a contract. Contract between whom? Contract between two parties. On the one hand, there is a corporate and on the other hand, there is a one group that is known as farmers. So there is a contract between corporate and farmers that is known as contract farming. However, under the contract farming, the corporate will be buying goods produced by the farmers and also the corporates will support farmers in various ways. They may provide credit to the farmers, they may provide skills to the farmers, they may provide input to the farmers. So there is an assured market will be available to the farmers under the Contract Farming Act. And under the, this system, what do we see that this will help in raising production in the country. This will also help the economy to improve the agricultural production and productivity in the country. It has a potential to bring a sea change in the agriculture sector. The farmers will get an assured market. So therefore, they will get benefited in various ways. Their income will rise. So in this context, you see the contract farming is an important development. So if you look at the little meaning of contract farming, it says it can be defined as agricultural production carried out according to an agreement between buyer and farmer, which establishes conditions for the production and marketing of a farm product or products. Under this, the farmer agrees to provide agreed quantities of a specific agriculture product. Along with this, the farmers also need to provide the quality standards and the supplier will get the product. And in turn, the buyers commit to purchase the product and in some cases to support production through various ways. Okay, It may supply the farm inputs, land preparation and the provision of technical device. So that is the contract farming. So it's a contract between farmers and corporates. And under this contract, the buyers will be buying the goods produced by the farmers. So that is the basic meaning of corporate farming. Now, there are various models of contract farming. If you look at across the world, there are various models that have been developed. So if you look at the models, there are mainly five models of contract farming that you can see across the world. One is the centralized model. Another is known as the nucleus model, which has come out from the uh, centralized model itself. There is another model that is known as multi-partite model. The fourth one is informant model and the fifth is intermediary model. We will look at these models, how it works in a very brief. So the centralized model, under the centralized model, it involves a centralized processor and they buy goods from a large number of small farmers. So there is a sponsor or this corporate. This corporate will buy goods from a 
number of farmers. So this is basically a centralized model. Under this one, the corporate will have a control on its product. So it will control through its management and administration. It will have its own technical staff and they will be taking uh, charge of the operations. This model is used for tree crops, annual crops, poultry and for dairy purposes. You can also see this kind of model in tea and vegetables. This is considered as vertically coordinated model where the quota allocation is done by the company and the company has tight quality control. Sponsors involvement in this model can be seen from providing input to control the most production aspects. So this is a centralized model. Under this model, the most of the things are controlled by the agency or the corporate or that is also known as sponsors. That's why it is considered as the centralized model. The second model is the nucleus state model. It is a variation of the centralized model itself where the sponsors also manages the central state and or plantation. So under this model, the corporates or sponsor also manages the central state and for the supply of extra amount of goods, they depend on large number of farmers. This is often used with resettlement and transmigration schemes. It involves a significant provision of material and management inputs. So what does happen under this system is that there is a central central state. This states provide a lot of support to the farmers in terms of material and management inputs and then they get the product from these farmers. Okay, in that sense, it becomes a bigger buyer. So that is the nucleus state model. Now the third model is the multipartite model. This model involves a variety of organization, frequently including statutory body. So the government bodies are utilizing in this purposes. So under this model, it can develop the, from the centralized or nucleus state model through the organization of farmers into cooperatives or the involvement of financial institutions. So what happens under this uh, institution that you see, there is an international company and there is a provincial company. This international company makes a joint venture with provincial company. The similar kind of arrangement that we have seen in 1988 when the PepsiCo was allowed to work in the contract farming with Punjab Cooperative Society. So the similar arrangement is considered as a, the multi-partite model. So under this model, there is a joint venture. Now with this joint venture, the provincial company has a capacity its capacity gets increased. Now the provincial company has its own branches across the district or at the local level in the country. So therefore they operates with the help of this international company. Now the various professionals of the provincial company works along with village committees who are representing the farmers in the village. So therefore here in this model, you see there are a lot of people engaged and there are a lot of system or companies engaged in this process. So that's why it is called as the multi-partite model. Under this one, the agreement is not happening between the farmers and the company directly. Okay, so this kind of model is often used when the contract farming process is in its nascent stage because the farmers need to be protected and they are protected by the government or provincial company. The next is another model that is known as informal model. This model is characterized by individual entrepreneurs or small companies. So there are a lot of individual entrepreneurs or small companies. Okay, so these small companies involved in informal production contracts with the farmers. It involves greater risk of extra contractual marketing. So under this one, you see being an informal organization, there are no formal contracts into in the system. And therefore, there are a lot of challenges in the informal model. This kind of model can be seen in the developing countries and the area which is underdeveloped. There is another model that is known as intermediate model. Under the intermediary model, it involves sponsors in subcontracting linkages. 
so there are major sponsor and this major in sponsor have sub sponsors across the regions these sub sponsors are responsible for collecting the goods from the farmers so that's why it is considered as intermediary model because there is existence of the subcontracting there is a danger with this system as the sponsors might lose the control over the production and the quality of the product so that's why the intermediary model is considered as a model where again you see the producer and sponsors have no direct linkages now we'll try to understand how this contract farming will help in the farmers to gain more money and at the same time what are the challenges that it poses to the farmers so first we'll look at the advantages so the first advantage you see the farmers will get input and production services from the sponsors now if you look at the current situation in agriculture the input cost is rising the farmers don't have sufficient money therefore they are not producing enough goods so here the problems of input will be addressed by the contract farming where the sponsors will provide input to the farmers the second benefit that the farmers will see that they will have access to the credit now there are a lot of farmers they don't have access to the credit even if they have access to the credit they have access to the informal credit in terms of money lenders and they charge huge money from the people third important benefit that we see in terms of introduction of new technology so the big companies will bring new technology in order to boost production in the country at the same times they will help the farmers to learn new skills this will help in increasing overall production in the country and at the same time it will also help in increasing the productivity and yield into the land and it will also help in rising the income of the farmers and the other benefit that you see the risk with related to the price can also be reduced further it opens new market for the farmers now the market is very limited to the farmers sometimes they don't have access to the market now there are mandis across the country but you if you look at the eastern india you won't find so many mandis are there and as a result the market is limited for farmers and especially the marginal and small farmers have a very limited scope in terms of access to market so this problem can be effectively dealt in the system of contract farming however there are many challenges as well so what are those challenges there can be issue of market failure and production problems sometimes when the new crops are grown if the corporate is not willing to buy the product in that case the market failure can have impact on farmers income the second is about the inefficient management let's say there is a contract between the two parties but if the sponsor and the corporate is unwilling to buy its own quota in that case there is inefficient management or marketing problems in that case you see the extra agricultural production made by the farmers will have a negative impact overall in their income similarly the third problem if you see there is unreliable or exploit a monopoly position so sponsor companies can in fact increase monopoly into the system so after the contract farming the contractor can enhance its monopolistic position in the region as a result the farmers will have no option but to sell their product to the corporate and in that case the corporate can decide its rate on its own now it's important to understand here is that the corporate that the agreement is between the two uneven players so that's why the farmers have a less bargaining capacity vis-a-vis the corporates or sponsor the fourth problem that you see in terms of the staff of the sponsoring organization may be corrupt in that case there can be misallocation of quotas to the farmers another problem that you see in the context of farmer is that when there is a production problem and excessive advance there can be issue of indebtedness to the farmers so there are challenges as well as some advantages at the same time 
you see there are some challenges with respect to the sponsors uh, also. So the first advantage that you see with respect to the sponsor that it is a more politically acceptable thing, especially when the contract farming is working with the small farmers. In that case, it is acceptable. It is more acceptable and politically it is acceptable to the people. The second uh, benefit that you see in terms of uh, a sponsor, the sponsor can overcome the land constraints. There are land constraints. The sponsor cannot have direct access to the lands. When the companies work with the small farmers, they can overcome the land constraints. They can get a short supply from the farmers. The third is production is more reliable than open market purchases. The sponsor companies faces less risk in terms of regular supply of the goods from the farmers. Apart from that, since the input will be provided by the sponsors or corporates, so it may ensure the consistent quality and therefore the quality of goods can be increased. However, there are some challenges. The challenges can be seen in the context of sustainable long-term operations. So there are some issues, especially the landless uh, farmers. If the land tenure is not guaranteed, in that case, it may affect the sustainable long-term operation in the production. Apart from that, you see there are poor management cases. If there are poor management and lack of consultation with the farmers, there can be issue of farmer discontent. In that case, again, the contract will get affected. Apart from that, we also see that farmer sometimes may sell the goods outside the contract. This can be done in order to get more profit from the market. So this is again a violation against the contract and there is a possibility from the farmers as well. Similarly, the farmers can also divert the inputs for some other purposes. For example, if the credit is uh, provided by the sponsor to the farmers, they can use it for some other purposes. So therefore, it will affect the yield in the agricultural field. So this kind of challenges you see in the context of contract farming. Now we'll look at the long history of contract farming laws. So it's not new that the contract farming has not for the first time it has been accepted by the people and this is the first time being practiced in the country. So it's not new in the country that we need to understand. So it is not the first time in 2021 we see the provisions related to contract farming. In fact, the provisions related to contract farming was practiced even during the British rule when the cash crops such as indigo, opium, tobacco and coat, cottons were sourced through the contract farming system. Even after independence, we see the contract farming was practiced in the commercial production of seed and sugarcane during the period of 1960s, in milk during the period of 70s, in tomatoes and poplar in 1980s. So it was widely practiced. In fact, in 1988, India allowed PepsiCo to procure some horticulture crops in Punjab. Similarly, there are a lot of companies started coming in after the success of PepsiCo's entry into the market. They started procuring chili, basmati rice, groundnut, palm oil, potato and marigold. Now what has happened? The, there was a structural change in 1991 because of 1991 reforms. So therefore, what started happening that in 1991, India adopted several reforms and the food economy gets changed. In fact, the people started earning and their income increases. As a result of this, there was a rising domestic demand for high value agriculture products. So there was demand for protein goods, there was demand for vegetables and fruits increased in the market. So therefore, the structural change is required in 1991. There was entry of more private sector firms in the food processing sector. There is a rapid growth of supermarkets and now we can see there are modern retail chains. Now these developments necessitate a steady and timely supply of fresh and quality agricultural produce. Now CF that is contract farming slowly emerged as a possible solution to meet this requirement. And as a result you see in 2000 India's first ever national agricultural policy was released. In fact this policy was advocating a greater private sector participation in agriculture through contract farming. 
So in 2000, the demand was made for contract farming from the national agricultural policy itself. If you look at in the first decade of this century, the growth can be seen. However, when the, there was a demand for private sector participation, but then there was a lot of problem. The problem was with respect to uh, the regulatory framework. Now, in the context of regulatory framework, the faster adoption of contract farming was not possible because the agriculture is a basically state subject. So agriculture marketing is also a state subject. And if you look at agriculture marketing, that is controlled by APMC, that is Agriculture Produce Market Committee. The APMC regulates the sale of agriculture produce in Mondays through its licensed trades and commission agents. The buyers, including the agribusiness farms, are prohibited from buying the farm produce outside the mandis. So therefore, you don't see the growth of contract farming despite of it being suggested by national agriculture policy. Now, there is a growing support for CF in first decade of this century. In fact, the companies started demanding the legal backing for contract farming. So in 2003, the center addressed this concern by drafting a model APMC Act 2003. It was circulated to the state for implementation and this act provided a lot of provision with respect to the direct selling by farmers to the farms, especially contract farming farms, which are registered with APMCs. However, due to resistance from commission agents, states were lukewarm towards promoting contract farming. Again in 2004, MS Swaminathan Committee, which is also known as National Commission for Farmer, recommended the design and implementation of a comprehensive code of conduct for contract farming. In 2007 again, National Policy for Farmers 2007 also made recommendation for contract farming. It encouraged contract farming practices and promised to prepare a code of conduct for contract farming. So what we see in the first decade of this century that the demand for contract farming was started by experts. Various experts suggested for the contract farming in the country. Now we further see the progress in the second decade. In 2013, the Empowered Committee of State Minister in Charge for Agriculture Marketing emphasized further reforms in the agriculture marketing for promoting contract farming. They made recommendation with respect to setting up a, a district level authority for registration of contract farming, delinking all aspects of contract farming practice from APMCs, promoting private market at par with the Mondays, and allowing farmers to sell their produce in the market of their choice. In 2017, the center drafted a new model act for governing the Mondays. In 2017 itself, the center constituted a committee consisting of officials from the central and state government to formulate a model contract farming act. Further, we see in May 2018, the center approved the final draft of the model contract farming act after various rounds of discussion with farmers and other stakeholders in agriculture sector. However, it was sent to the state, but except Tamil Nadu, no other state enacted the CF legislation based on the model act. And finally, in 2020, the act come into existence in the current form. In 2020, the central government promulgated the Farmers Empowerment and Protection Agreement of Price Assurance and Farm Services Bill in 2020. In September 2020, the parliament passed the Farmers Empowerment and Protection Agreement of Price Assurance and Farm Services Bill 2020. With this, the parliament has passed the bill. Now we'll discuss about the provisions mentioned in this act. Now here you need to understand that I already talked about there are three farms bills that have been passed by the parliament. We will restrict to discuss only one that is related to contract farming. So this is the Farmers Empowerment and Protection Agreement of Price Assurance and Farm Services Bill 2020. What this uh, act talk about. It talks about empowering the farmers for engaging with processor, wholesaler, aggregators, large retailers, exporter on a label playing field. It also ensures 
price assurance to farmers even before sowing of crops. It tells in case of higher market price, the farmer will be entitled to the, this price over and above the minimum price. The fourth provision you see that it seeks to transfer the risk of market unpredictability from the farmer to the sponsor. Due to prior price determination, the farmers will be shielded from the rise and fall of market prices. So therefore, the farmers will get benefited. The risk in the market will be sucked by the sponsors or corporates. Another provisions that you see, it will enable the farmer to access modern technology, better seed and other inputs that we have already talked about the benefits of contract farming. It will also reduce the cost of marketing since the marketer or aggregator will come to the villages to collect the goods. So therefore it will help in improving the income of the farmers. At the same time, the act is also mentioning about the dispute resolution mechanism. Whereas it is mentioned that all the redressal will be addressed in a time bound manner. It further gives impetus to research and development and infusion of new technology in agriculture sector. So this is what the provision is made under the bill. This are the, this are, these are the major provisions under the bill. Now there has been clarification issued by the government. The, under this clarification, the government has clearly said that the farmers will have full power in the contract to fix the selling price of his goods. They will receive payments within the maximum three days. So this is a significant development. Apart from that, the government will promote, apart from that, the government will promote 10,000 farmer producer organization. These farmer producer organization will bring together the small farmers and will ensure that remunerative pricing of farm produce is given to the farmers. Further, after signing the contracts, it is not the responsibility of the farmers to transport the goods to the purchaser or sponsor. The sponsor will come to pick up the produce directly from the farm. Apart from that, in case of any dispute, there will be no need to go court repeatedly. There will be a local dispute redressal mechanism. So under this act, this has been clearly mentioned that there will be a local dispute redressal mechanism in the system. So therefore, the farmers will not have to go to the court for addressing their concern. Now we'll discuss about the pros and cons of the act or bill. The first thing that we see, it provides freedom of choice to the farmers. Now the farmers can sell its product to anyone they are not restricted to mandis only. They can sell it to the aggregators. They can sell it to the wholesalers. They can sell it to the mandis. They can sell it to the uh, the new startups that are coming. So they can sell it to everyone or anyone. Okay. So now you see they have a vast canvas done. Now they can sell it to anyone. So the choice are available to them. So once the choice increases, they can fetch more price for their goods okay in that case their income will rise that is the first benefit that will be provided to the farmers under the act the second benefit that it empowers the farmers to bypass the middleman now they are not restricted to sell their goods to the middleman in the mondays these middlemen basically charge the rent from these farmers as a result they are not entitled to get all the benefits by selling their goods into the Mondays. Now what will happen? The farmers will not have to pay to these middlemen. So therefore they will be entitled to get the benefits by selling their goods. The third benefits under this act is that it formulates a standard framework on the agreement that will help the farmers to involve with agribusiness companies, retailers, exporters directly now there is no requirement of middleman into the system okay now they can directly contact with agribusiness companies retailers exporters and so on now the farmers will have access to modern technology skills and so on so these are the benefits or these are the pros under the bills that we can 
C. However, there are some challenges to the bill. There are some cons of the bills as well. The first thing you see, the farmers will expose to the corporates. Here you need to understand the contract farming is an uh, agreement between two uneven players. It is not agreement between two even players. So here in this case, you see the farmers will have a less bargaining capacity. They are weak. They will not be able to fight in case there is a dispute between farmers and the corporate. They will not be able to fight with these corporates. The second cons we see in terms of the difference in terms of reality and what is suggested under the article. Now it is said that the companies will be providing lot of benefits to the farmers. However, in reality, we see the farmers are not getting all the benefits when there is a uh, increase in the goods prices in the market. In that case, they force the farmers to sell their product to them. Now, what happens when there is a price reduction? In that case, the farmers are in a disadvantageous situation. Corporates are not willing to fulfill its obligation. The third problem we see in, in the context of uh, the monopoly that can be created by the corporate itself. Now it is suggested that the current act will help in reducing the monopoly of APMC. However, there is a probability that an ecosystem of monopoly is created by the corporate institution itself. Now you cannot avoid the fact that market runs in a different way. There may be collaboration and collusion among the corporate or big corporate institution and in fact that practices may harm the farmers and this is what happens in a capitalist system. So this is what the kind of problem that the farmers may face into the system. So what we have discussed under this video, first we have talked about the context why we are discussing this particular thing. Now the second thing we have discussed about the contract farming, we have seen its definition, we have seen uh, what is contract farming, what are the benefits, what are the challenges of contract farming. Uh, whether it is uh, benefiting to the farmers, whether it is benefiting to the uh, sponsors. After that, we have seen the, the, the development of contract farming in the country. We have also seen the recent contract uh, farming act that has been passed by the parliament and we have also looked at the pros and cons of the bill. So this is the discussion uh, about the contract farming laws. Now, I hope you have understood everything in this video. Thank you.